Hi, welcome to this video on principal component analysis, also known as PCA. So I'll try to motivate it in, in this video, and then there'll be another uh, couple of videos giving the details of, of principal component analysis. Okay, so in many of the previous videos so far, we've been looking in particular at supervised learning, right, where we had this unknown target function, there's some input distribution that generates training examples. These training examples are fit into a learning algorithm that again produce a hypothesis that is supposed to look a lot like this unknown target function, right. So this has been the focus uh, so far. And uh, from this video and the next uh, couple of videos, we'll sk uh, instead shift to unsupervised learning which was mentioned briefly in the beginning and in unsupervised learning, right? There are many different represented problems one could look at, one being clustering and another being embeddings. And embeddings is gonna be the focus of, of these videos that we're gonna see, right? So, so in clustering, right? The basic idea was to partition data into similar groups. Whereas in embeddings, we're looking for a good representation of input data. Okay, so let's get into more details with what such a good representation could be. Right, so maybe just to again highlight the key difference uh, by, between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Again, in the supervised learning, right, there is this unknown target function mapping our feature vectors, d dimensional vectors, into an output domain of labels. And the input consists of training examples where we see evaluations of this unknown target function on different feature vectors. We also saw generalizations where the input domain need not be RD, but just a general domain X. And in general, the goal is to predict this evaluation of this unknown target function on a new element where we only see the features, right? So we want to learn this unknown target function f. Now, in unsupervised learning, there's basically the main difference is that there's no unknown target function. So basically, there are only the features, feature vectors, or input elements in the input domain x1 up to xn. And then the goal could be, for instance, a group or cluster them based on similarities in the x size, so only in the features, right? So, so there's no predefined uh, scheme that assigns labels, but we just want to group them into some things that look similar based on the feature vectors, right? And it could, another uh, idea could be to change these x size, the, the feature representations to help learning algorithms, the speed up algorithms, and so forth, right? And we'll particularly look at this this last setup uh, today. Okay, and embeddings will be the focus of the next many uh, videos. Okay. Now, in these first videos, in, in particular in PCA, what we're after is so-called dimensionality reduction. Uh, so often when you collect data, right, it could be the case that the data is redundant. So in, for every input element, right, we measure a whole lot of features. And, you know, it could be the case that several of these features are related. For instance, if you're measuring features of a car, uh, if you don't think too much about it, maybe you've measured the speed in miles per hour, the fuel can, uh, how much fuel it can carry, the color, the number of seats, uh, and perhaps you also measured the speed in kilometers per hour, right? So, so in this case, right, it's clear that these two features highlighted in red are redundant, right? They're basically measuring the same thing, just with a different scaling. Uh, it could also be that some of the data is highly correlated. For instance, the uh, student's work ethics and the grade in some course, right? So this could also be the case. And in these examples, right, it could be that maybe it suffices with fewer measurements, fewer features, right? So the basic idea in dimensionality reduction would be to, in some sense, remove redundancy in the data features. It could also be to extract useful information. So PCA can, in, in many ways, also be thought of as a way of finding, I guess, the most important combinations of features if you will, but but we'll take the point of view as removing redundancies. That's the most important in, in our presentation of it, right? So debate, we want to reduce the number of features. And, you know, many of the uh, learning algorithms that we've seen, their running time depends on the number of features of the training data. And so, you know, this will help speed up algorithms. It could also reduce the memory consumption of storing a training data set and so on. So there can be many benefits of doing this. If you can reduce the number of features all the way down to two or three, maybe you could even use this uh, for visualization, right? So you can plot the data and look at it. Right. It could also be used to remove noise. Uh, if, uh, for instance, some of the features are very noisy, maybe reducing the number of features, if you can somehow get rid of the noise, could also be uh, a benefit of dimensionality reduction. Okay. So that's one of the some of the, the reasons why one would want to do dimensionality reduction. Okay, so let's have a look at redundancies, right? So maybe this miles per hour, kilometers per hour setup would basically correspond to, if you just plotted those two features of your training samples, then you'll see that there's a linear dependency among them. One of them is always a scaling of the other. 
And so you could, you know, maybe you could draw a line through if you just look at these two features. The data is actually really only one dimensional, even though it's it has two features. And probably if you want to use it for a learning, right, you might as well just use this one dimensional representation where the, basically you just use the position along the screen line as your single feature, right? It should capture all the same information as there was there before. So, so hopefully this is just as good a representation for learning as the first one is. Okay. Now, uh, importantly, right, in unsupervised learning, like the labels play no role in the embedding. So, you know, basically these labels that were there before, we can just ignore them, right? They, they don't matter and they're not necessary for this embedding. So we're only looking at the features to determine this embedding, right? So, so typically we'll just think of it as there's no, uh, there's no label of the, on the training example. And, and here again, right, you can find this uh, linear dependency by only looking at the feature vectors, right? Okay, so let's look at another example of where you might have redundant features. So if you look at the MNIST uh, data set, which is a very popular uh, image recognition data set, a very simple one where you have pictures of handwritten digits, and each of these pictures are 784 pixels uh, in the grayscale image. So, so really, if you represent them as a vector, there's 784 dimensions of features of each and every one of these images, which is a lot, right? And of course, right, if you think about it, like if you look at it, say a random 784 pixel image, then this will look nothing like one of those digits, right? So there's somehow, there's a lot of redundancy in using 784 uh, features to represent just these 10 different digits. And so in principle component analysis, the basic idea is that if you have such high dimensional data, uh, in with d-dimensional feature vectors, then the basic idea is to take this data and project these vectors onto a subspace, a k-dimensional subspace. And uh, if we do this, then the point of it is that we will only need k features to represent these projections, basically because the projected uh, images or vectors, you can just write it in a basis of this subspace, meaning that you only need one feature for each of the... Um, basis vector in an arbitrary basis of this subspace. Okay, so let's, in the rest of this video, just remind us of how does projections work, projections onto k-dimensional subspaces, right? So linear algebra recap. So let's say I have a vector x and I want to project it onto a vector z. So this is, we want to compute this orthogonal projection. P here is the projection of x onto z, right? So it's in the direction of z and it's the orthogonal projection. So we project it orthogonally onto z. Okay, so let's just remind us of how could one compute this, this point P. So we have a couple of observations, right? So this X minus P, right? That's the vector that goes from P out to X. Uh, so as we just said, right? This vector here is the orthogonal, it's the orthogonal projection onto set. So this has to be orthogonal to set, meaning that X minus P is in a product onto set has to be zero. Okay, so that's our first observation. Now, what else do we know? If we want to compute P, what else do we know? We know that P... Uh, is some linear scaling of set, right? So there's some scaling C such that P is equal to C times set, right? So it's in the direction of set here, okay? Now, if we combine these two properties, we actually get a formula for uh, P. So, so first of all, right, if we plug in uh, the C times set in place of P up here, we're using that this orthogonality constraint, we get that X minus C times set in a product set has to be equal to zero. Okay, so let's... Uh, multiply the set in using linearity here and in the inner product, we get uh, X is in a product with set, the C times sets in a product with itself has to equal zero. Okay. And now let's get a formula for C out of this, right? So we'll try to isolate C, move C to the other side, divide by set transpose set. And we get a formula here that we should set C to be X is in a product with a set divided by sets in a product with itself. And Right, this was the formula for C, and we know that P in general was C times set. So the formula for P becomes X is in a product with set divided by sets in a product with itself times set. So this gives the vector P, just using what we know about it. Okay, and uh, let's simplify it a little bit, and let's assume that we're only going to project onto vector set that have unit norm, right, whose length is one. Because if a, uh, a norm has a vector has length uh, one, its inner product with itself is the sum of the squares of the entries, which is the square of its norm, but the square of one is just one. 
Okay, so for unit length vectors, Z transpose Z is just one. And then the, the simplified formula, the, the denominator here disappears. And now the simplified formula is just the projection is equal to X is in a product with self, or sorry, in a product with Z multiplied with Z. Okay, so it's a simple formula for the projection. So, so basically what happens here is that the inner product between X and Z gives the length of the projection. And then Z is just, you go in the direction of Z. Right, so because set is unit length here again, right? So the inner product is just the length of the projection. Okay, so a simple formula for computing projections. And so this is if I want to project X onto a unit norm vector, I just compute it's the inner product with X onto the vector and multiply with the vector itself. Right, and this is actually the same as projecting onto a one-dimensional subspace spanned by the vector set. Right, this is what we get if we want to project onto a one-dimensional subspace. Now, if I want to project onto a k-dimensional subspace, so let's say I have a basis for the subspace, and let's say I restrict myself to looking at orthonormal basis, so which means that these set one to set k are orthogonal to each other, and they all have a unit length, right? That's the definition of an orthonormal basis for a sub k-dimensional subspace. So in the picture here, right, maybe set one has unit length and is in this direction here, set two, is in this direction, it's an orthogonal to set one. And now I have a general uh, X here that I want to project onto it. So let's say these are all three dimensional vectors and I want to project X onto the subspace spanned by set one and set two. So I want to compute this point here. Now, the formula for doing this, if they have unit length, is I just project it onto each of them and sum it up, right? So I project onto the set one, meaning I have to compute the inner product between X and set one, multiplied with set one. Then I compute the inner product with X onto set two, multiplied with set two, and then I sum these two vectors up, and that gives me P. Right? So that's just the formula. So I just project onto each of them and sum them up when these, uh, and here we're basically using that they are orthogonal and that the each of them has unit norm. So, so basically, this means that I'm computing the length. Uh, basically, I'm computing the length of p onto uh, the set direction, set one direction. I'm computing the length of p onto the set two projection uh, vector here. And when if I sum those up, I end up out at p. Right. So that's the the formula in general for computing such projections. Okay. So in principle component analysis, what we're going to do is we're going to project our feature vectors onto a k-dimensional subspace, right? This is uh, the basic assumption or uh, basic goal in principal component analysis. Equivalently, right, the basic idea is to find k orthogonal unit length vectors, set one up to set k, and then we're going to project every feature vector x onto, well, that you sum over all these feature vectors, our basis vectors, take the inner product between x and each of them and multiply it with the corresponding vector. Okay. Now, what I could do is I could write X in this new basis, right? So what you can see here is that, well, basically you have the basis vectors and then you have a scalar onto each of them. So if I want to write X in this basis of the subspace, all I have to do, well, I, I take my X uh, hat here. So basically this is P, the, the vector P, the projection P, are uh, written in this basis of this, corresponding to the set eyes. So you can see that each of the coordinates, but I have one coordinate for each of the basis vectors. So it's just the inner product with X on uh, set one, all the way up to the X's inner product with set K. This is my new representation of X. This is the representation of the projection P. Right? So this is just a vector. And the point is that this vector has just uh, K features, right? So there's only one number for each of the basis vectors. So effectively we have reduced the number of uh, features of our X in particular, we could imagine having many more features to begin with. For instance, these MNIST images would have 724 uh, features to begin with. And now they have only K if K is much less than 724. So we like this uh, very much, right? So now I guess the question that remains to be specified in PCA is, you know, which basis should we choose? Which vectors set one up to set K should we be using? And this is what we'll try to argue for in the next uh, videos.